Greetings in Christ. This is Victor and the Psalter. It's a pleasure to be with you today. It is now the fourth Sunday in ordinary time. As you can see, I'm wearing my white alb, not out of some pretentious desire to be quasi-religious, I mean, um, or as if I belong to a religious order, but just to remember, remind us that Sunday is a time to remember the resurrection and wearing the white robe symbolizes our risen life in Christ. And so it's just a visual aid to the underlying theme of every Sunday, uh, of, of the purpose of Sunday. I hope that you're spending your Sundays in quiet meditation and prayer with God's Word because without having at least one day of spiritual retreat with the Lord it will be a very difficult battle for you along the way and ahead. Today's video will be we will be focusing in on the book of Ezra. I finally prayed through Chronicles and Kings and I finished Ezra on Friday. I am thoroughly impressed with these books and very inspired to seek the Word of God more intensely and to apply it in day-to-day -day life. I think without going into too much detail, um, I first of all I encourage you to read Ezra and Nehemiah uh, because they provide an excellent backdrop and example an example for what it is to be committed to your faith to put your faith and the Word of God above everything else so anyway one thing that I got during my Lectio Divina time reading Ezra is just how much stress and how important how much importance the people of God or Ezra places on the temple. When the Jews return to Jerusalem after their long exile in Babylon, what did they do? Was the first thing they started doing. The first thing they did was reestablish their religious life. Notice that they didn't start worrying about digging wells or um, searching for gold or um, opening up businesses. The first thing that they wanted to commit themselves to was the reestablishment of the liturgy, the reestablishment of the faithful participation in their religious life. In other words, the spiritual life came first. I remember when um, there was uh, a natural disaster in Haiti and John Paul II got a lot of criticism because the first thing he started helping, the first thing the church started helping with uh, in their um, recovery from this natural disaster, I think it was an earthquake, was the rebuilding of churches. A lot of people were saying, you see, the church is out to proselytize, doesn't really care about the little man. The church is out there to just um, take advantage of those ignorant poor people. And um, what can be deduced from this is that the, the, the Pope was simply doing what Ezra and what, the, uh, what, what any good Christian or uh, any good follower of God would have done. He put the spiritual life first because once your spiritual life is in good good shape, if your spiritual life is vital and healthy, and if you're living a, an intense prayer life, then everything else will follow. And so Ezra and Nehemiah represent both the uh, the laity. Nehemiah was a lay person. He was not a priest, not a Levite. And Ezra, of course, was a Levite. So we have that priest and layman um, dual action going on there, how they both are involved in the rest restoration, the restoration of the Jewish religious life. So what we can learn from this is how in our own lives, we need to take inventory of how closely 
we're following Christ in our daily lives? How how much are we really em uh, uh, emphasizing and and devoting time to the spiritual life? Now, when I say spiritual life, I just don't I don't just mean kneeling and praying all the time. What I mean is. When you do your daily work, do you see it as a service? Do you wake up in the morning and think, okay, I'm going to go out and do a service for mankind? Because in a sense, our jobs, as someone who works, can be seen as apostolates. If we put all of our heart and soul into our work and think of it as a service to mankind, so if you're a mechanic, you're helping people get around on the, in their cars. If you are, if you're a cab driver, you're helping people get from point A to point B. If you're a janitor, my goodness, you're you're helping you're helping prevent the spread of so many viruses and bacteria, it, and especially with this coronavirus. I mean, I think janitors and people who do housekeeping should get a bonus because of just how critical their work is in preventing the spread of diseases. So everybody has a role. Everybody has a purpose. And when we commit ourselves to the spiritual life, we recognize that purpose in our own life. In my case, when I spend quality time in prayer, for example, what I got out of Ezra, besides the importance of prayer and knowing the Word of God and living the Word of God, I was thinking to myself, how can I be Ezra now? How can I be Nehemiah now in the 21st century? as a married lay Catholic. And I didn't really quite get a, a response yet, but then I went downstairs and started spending time as I usually do with my sons. And my sons were asking me to draw, to, to, to help them draw pictures. Uh, they, were help, uh, they were asking me to help them with their homework. And as I was helping them, I used to be very annoyed and impatient with them while doing homework with them. But as I was helping them with their homework, I realized that quality time joyfully spent helping my children with their homework, being their private tutor and their companion and their father at the same time, it was in a sense rebuilding the temple in my home. Because that intimate experience with my children, it carries over, it spills over into, their, their how, into how they view me as a father and how they view parenthood. And sometimes I really have to remind myself that I, as a father, you, if you're a married man and have children, you know we are the face of God to our children. We represent God. We are the high priests of our families. And so that's why the spiritual life is so critical. We should never ignore nurturing our spiritual lives through prayer and through, you know, constant study of God's Word and the Church's teachings because without that vibrant spiritual life it, the fatherhood is going to be more like a chore okay I help them with their homework now I can go watch TV or okay now I did that chore now I can go uh, play play with my buddies uh, it's just it becomes this endless cycle of just getting things over with rather than thriving as a parent so as we approach this Lenten season, I invite fathers out there to commit to a, a really intense spiritual life. You know, pray the Psalms more often, pray the Liturgy of the Hours, find a book in the Bible and just stick with it. Just uh, pray, pr pray it and ask the Holy Spirit to enlighten you through this word. So Ezra teaches us that we are to place our love of God and His Holy Word first. If anything else is going to work. Like Jesus says, you put the kingdom of God first and then everything else will follow. I'm preaching to myself as well here. Uh, uh, it's, it's a constant struggle. And don't be surprised if when you try, when you make an attempt, don't be surprised if all of a sudden you're flooded with distractions. Because the devil is no fool. He knows that the second you commit yourself to the spiritual life, the Holy Spirit's going to work through you and very good things are going to happen and you will be a direct threat to Satan's kingdom. So fight against those temptations by sticking to a consistent prayer life. That's one of the reasons I'm always advertising the Liturgy of the Hours because
The liturgy of the hours keeps us constantly in touch with God's word at different points of the day. And in between those, those points, we commit ourselves to labor, to holy labor at work. It's a, it's a thrill. It really is a thrill. And when we can wake up in the morning and think, I am a son of God, I am here to be a temple of the Holy Spirit in this world. I'm here to be to represent the risen Christ at work, at home, anywhere. So, if you read Ezra, think about that. And Nehemiah also. And Nehemiah, he, like Ezra, uh, committed to the Word of God and tried his best to make it accessible to the people. One of the most powerful scenes, and I've already read it in another video when I was commenting on Pope Francis's Apero et Ilis, which again is probably the greatest thing to come out of his papacy. Apero et Ilis, get that document, read it and pray it. You'll, you'll, it'll make you want to read the Bible over and over again. Apero et Ilis, okay? Um, Alright, so Ezra teaches us how, and Nehemiah teaches us that we should, put, we should put our faith first before everything and then everything else will follow. Next thing I wanted to talk about is um, the coronavirus. Uh, it's really scary, it's very sobering to think that um, even in the 21st century we can have these pandemics that could wipe out so many people. How do we respond to that? You know, well first of all, if you're, if you're not sick, be thankful to God that, you were pre that you're preserved so far from this virus. I haven't got anything yet, but um, I admit I'm, I'm scared. I'm, I'm scared for my children. I live in Asia, so it's very easy to get sick if in this area. Um, and so I'm reminded of something that St. Louis de Montfort said um, when he, when he, when he uh, published his Meditations on Death. He says, when you what St. Louis de Montfort said is that you must prepare yourself for death every day. You must prepare your coffin mentally every day. Accept death. And, when you, and if you get sick, if it's even, even if it's with a common cold, anytime you get sick, just assume that you will die from the sickness. Anytime you get sick, just assume, accept that you will die from the sickness. And what that does is it actually takes away some of the discomfort from the disease because then you accept whatever God's will is for your life. Doesn't mean you don't medicate, you don't take your medications, but you just accept that there's a chance that you can get worse and that some of those medications will not work. Some of those medicines may not work if it's a serious virus. Um, so it doesn't take away the pain, it doesn't take away the suffering, but what it does is it places it in a perspective in that you're able to endure that suffering in a way that only God can understand. I don't, I don't know how else to put it. And that, I would like to end that this particular meditation on Ezra and on sickness by quoting the Catechism. See, I do like the New Catechism also. There is a section, an article here on the anointing of the sick. It's in the second part of the Catechism on the celebration of the Christian mystery or on the sacraments. And it has a very, it has two very short but very insightful paragraphs on the church's attitude towards illness. Um, and this is at paragraph 1500 and 1501, so uh, 1500 and 1501. It, the, the heading is illness in human life. Illness and suffering have always been among the gravest problems confronted in human life. In illness, man experiences his powerlessness, his limitations, and his finitude. Every illness can make us glimpse death. Every illness can make us glimpse, glimpse death. So see your illness as a glimpse of what eventually will happen. It's sad but true. We will each have to meet our Maker, and each of us will have to pass through the terrifying gates of death. Sad but true. Unless we're fortunate enough to be still standing when the general resurrection happens at the end of time. 
but the chances of that are few and far between. Illness can lead to anguish, self-absorption, sometimes even despair and revolt against God. It can also make a person more mature, helping him dis discern in his life what is not essential so that he can turn toward that which is essential. He oft very often illness provokes a search for God and a return to Him. Okay. So illness but however mild it is, can remind us that we are mortal, that we are finite beings, and that we depend on God for eternal life. That we have no power over the moment that we die. It's a very scary reality, but in a sense it's also a comforting reality to know that that department is not ours to deal with. Death was not supposed to happen, but we brought death into the world through the sin of our parents, our first parents. But Christ faced death for us. The risen Christ wants to raise us up. He wants to bring us back to life now. So let's invite the risen Christ into our sickness, whether it be spiritual sickness, mental illness, or physical. Invite the Holy Spirit into that so He can help you. It may not, it may not be a complete healing, but in God's own wisdom, perhaps He leaves whatever suffering we have to us so we can learn how to draw closer to Him. But we do know that sickness and illness is not something that God really wants to happen. For example, he healed, he healed so many sick people during his earthly ministry. And from that we can see that sickness is not eternal. It's all temporary. And it's, it, it can be a moment of purification. So as we cope with this harsh reality of the coronavirus. We pray for the Chinese people. We pray for all the doctors working around the clock to remedy this problem and to eradicate this virus from our midst. And we pray for those who are suffering from this illness at this very moment, that they may unite their sufferings with Christ and that He may fortify them for whatever happens, whether it be healing or death. And I ask for my own fortification. I ask for God to strengthen me and, and you all. And I ask for prayers for my older brother. One final thought on death and sickness. Um, we live in a I guess a global culture where people almost act as if there is no death, as if all of life consists of Facebook and Twitter. People seem more concerned about this or that article of clothing or this or that gadget or gizmo that the very thought of death seems to be almost like a fantasy until something like the coronavirus happens. So. This is not any kind of private revelation, but perhaps perhaps God is allowing this to happen the same reason He allowed it to happen in the past throughout biblical history is to wake us up, to wake us up to the harsh reality, that gritty reality that one day we will have to pass away and meet Him on His judgment seat. So let's make a return to God. Let's make, a, let's make a complete return to the Word of God. And let's devote as much time as possible to praying for those who need it most and to renewing our, life, renewing our spiritual lives by the grace of God.
And that brings us full circle to Ezra and Nehemiah. That's exactly what they did. They led the people of God back to a fruitful spiritual life through the Word of God. And at every Mass, every Mass we experience that return from exile. Every Mass, we the people of God come together and adore and worship the living God on the altar through the Holy Sacrifice of the Mass. And we hear His Word just like the time when the, the Jewish people heard the Word of God from Ezra and Nehemiah and all the scribes who delivered the Word to them. Praise be God in all of His wisdom.